Welcome, my sisters and brothers, to this homily for Christmas Day. And the Church proposes us for the four Masses associated with Christmas Day for uh, different Gospels, well, actually three different Gospels. Um, for two of the Masses, it's the Lucan account of Jesus' birth. Uh, for one of the accounts, for one of the Gospels, it's Matthew's account, which we actually had last week, but including the genealogy, so it's the whole of the genealogy and the passage we had last week. Um, and for the other Mass, we have uh, the beginning of St. John's Gospel. And since for the last two Christmases, I've uh, used the Lucan passage, and we had the Matthean passage last week, uh, I thought that I'd take a quick look at uh, the beginning of John's Gospel, uh, even though in one sense it seems the furthest removed from uh, what we're used to at Nativity, which is focusing down on the very practical uh, issues of baby, manger, beasts, swaddling clothes, stars, shepherds, uh, all those very particular human or human and animal things um, which attend a birth. And what we get in John's Gospel, if you like, uh, seems so extraplanetary uh, that we pass it off with uh, something like dismay at having to interpret it. Um, so I don't want to attempt a full interpretation, which of course would be uh, quite impossible. These are um, these eighteen verses are some of the most remarkable words uh, ever to have been written in any human language. Uh, it would be foolish to try it. Um, it would be foolish to try and expatiate too wildly on them. Um, what I would like to do is to say how much closer I think they are to our more concrete, uh, more human, more historical sense of a little baby uh, in precarious situation in Bethlehem than perhaps we might give credit for. I'm taking it, as many do, that there is a basic uh, chiastic structure in, in St. John's uh, prologue, meaning that the, the first and the last verses uh, reflect each other and so on. Uh, through the middle until you get to the central uh, point. And of course, the discastic structure has been slightly altered by the putting in of the bits of John the Baptist, um, which were probably not in the original poetry, but were put in so as to help make sense of what was coming about. Um, but the, the, so the first, first, the first verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. After we've been through the history, comes out as no one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Um, why do I say that's odd? The two explain each other in this strange way. In the beginning was the criterion, was the word the beginning for us of creation. This does reflect uh, Genesis. It would have been understood to a, a Jewish uh, audience or anyone who knew anything about how the temple worked and how the Holy of Holies was the microcosm uh, of the whole of creation outside which God and God's angels were. Of course no one could see God. It was only as God's criterion showed itself and the criterion shows itself, the word, in creation. You remember the Genesis narrative, and God said, the creative word, the word that creates. So the word was, at the very beginning of all things, the word was with God, and the word was God. So the creative thing is not simply an extra thing that God happens to do. It is God's criteria for God. We are actually learning something about who God is when God makes God's criterion available to us in 
and as and through creation. We pair that off with the very end. No one has ever seen God. Perfectly sensible, absolutely standard. Um, uh, of course, uh, God is not an object that can be seen. That's not at all what is meant by any use of uh, uh, language about God by anybody uh, rational, really. That would be a God, a God who can be seen. No one has ever seen God. It's God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. So the criterion that was with God and the criterion was God was in the beginning with God. So it turns out that the criterion for everything being is a son. And that's, in a sense, the most extraordinary claim that's for us to understand and from which to get a glimpse of what's going on in the Christmas story. It's God, the only Son, is God's criterion, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. In other words, that the criteria for bringing everything into being is that of a father's love for a son. The underpinning reality of everything that is is this sort of affection. The structure, the very structure of reality is made available to us through this sort of love. Given that, it's perhaps less surprising that the midpoint of the chiasmus, and we could go through it verse by verse all the way up and down, that would take far too long, it'd be far too complicated, at least for me. Um, but the midpoint of the chiasmus is he came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. That's the central line. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Here's the suggestion that the very structuring force of reality, which is a loving structure, <laughs> finally came into our midst, came into the midst as something that can enlighten us, light us up from within, was the light, was the source of our seeing, has come in. And for those who receive him, who believe in his name, believe that his name is the same as of the name, he gives power to become children of God who are born not of bloods, which might refer just to the uh, the two people involved in conception, or it might refer to the way in which mythical uh, stories of creation and therefore of birth happen through massacres, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. So the notion that there is a being brought into being according to who the Father is, who the God is and what God's love is that actually seeks to bring us into being as children of God. And that means us being aligned with what really is. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. He's talking about people being brought into being so that we may actually participate on the inside of creation and discover what really is. And that the way that this was made available to us started, of course John doesn't say this, we only get this in Matthew and Luke, started with the bizarre, the bizarrely powerless seeming, seeming sign 
of the babe born in Bethlehem. This was a holy, fully human sign. It's us learning to detect the love of the only begotten Son, the only begotten uh, God, the only begotten. Um, it also appears to be a way of referring to uh, Isaac in the Abraham story. He was referred to as God's, uh, in, in one translation, it's only begotten son, which wasn't true, of course, because Abraham had Ishmael, another son, and often it's translated as beloved. So it clearly it does not refer to something numerical. It refers to a quality of love. That there is a purpose to everything which happens. If you like the friendliness towards us humans of everything that there is is not known to us. We are so often stuck in darkness, not able to see what is really happening. The law tried to enable us to stand upright a little bit, to learn what is true, to understand something about how the Creator wanted us to see and participate in the creation. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The sense of the tenderness, the not out to get us, the friendly quality, the backdrop to everything that, that there is, that this is a friendly, gentle adventure. Strangely, it's that. I feel like it's the background colours to the nativity picture that are some of the most difficult things to get. The background colours which are of the whole of creation actually being vastly more friendly to us if only we could learn to find our way into being sons and daughters of God, those who are actually on the inside of creation as it is, to use Paul's language, but the same message is here. So, as you come to Christmas celebration this year, think not only of the 3D figures in the crash, what they say about a God's power being shown forth in being disposed to be absolutely weak in the middle of precarious situation, in the middle of uh, people who were going to make his life difficult and ultimately kill him. But also the vast backdrop of the sheer friendliness of creation. That which we're becoming used to learning about and seeing ourselves as sons and daughters. This is, if you like, not a moral thing, but us being shown who God really is. So no one has ever seen God. It's God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Everything that we learn about God is going to be learned through following the human life of Jesus. And it's going to show us that there is an extraordinary power in weakness, an extraordinary joy in our discovering our likeness with apparent others, and that all these actually tend to show a vastly richer project, adventure, a friendly adventure, which is creation. And that this is the constant backdrop drop to everything that is. Curiously, it's the difficulty of receiving and living from that backdrop, which is one of the real challenges of our lives and one of the real joys of Christmas. Asking ourselves, am I a little bit closer to that this year? Is the world a little bit friendlier? Is it out of gratitude that I'm able to give presents? Just because I'm so pleased to be in part of this world, rather than, oh, I've got to go through the usual drag of presents and all that. For me, that's the, the question. 
uh, that I want to, well, that's brought to my mind by these uh, astounding verses from St. John. And with that, I wish you a very happy Christmas, and along with the Gospel text in the, um, in the little bit below the picture in the YouTube, I've put a link to Jussi Björling singing O Holy Night, uh, which for me is one of the uh, absolute must-haves of the Christmas season and one of the most beautiful pieces of uh, singing of that great carol uh, that I know. And furthermore, it's in Swedish, so I can't understand it, so we don't have the terrible words <laughs> uh, of the original French, which are full of exactly the worst sort of sacrificial nonsense that it's very, very good not to be able to understand. Very happy Christmas to you all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.